So can once you, can, you, can you see my can you see my before we start? Can you see my slides? Perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Okay, great. This is, how much time do we have, by the way? Uh, all is yours. I mean, we have nothing but time. Okay. Okay. All right. So just give me a couple of minutes. I'll just introduce this to the speakers, and then you feel free to uh, uh, start from the uh, your slide. Uh, okay. Good evening and uh, good morning. Welcome you all to this uh, the. Uh, uh, series of uh, talk organized by the Journal of Hand Microsurgery called as the uh, Interact with the Pioneer and Learn series. So, so on this occasion, we have the pioneer, uh, Dr. Michael Sain from uh, uh, the Anderson uh, University, Anderson Center for Hospital, especially for the cancer and the reconstructive surgery. And it's always a privilege and honor to have him today. Um, actually, I supposed to meet him in the uh, WSR of Mexico and we could not meet him there. Uh, he's a board certified uh, plastic surgeon uh, he's also a, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons from the Canada, and there's a whole lot of credit to him. Uh, he has more than uh, uh, 200 uh, publications and uh, uh, authored uh, uh, three books. I think the editor in chief, and also had um, more than 200 presentations in the national and international podium. Also, to his credit, there are a lot of things he has contributed to various departments from Mayo Clinic, uh, in Texas, and other universities. He started various programs there in the hospitals. Um, his preferences is probably the um, a lot of uh, you know, uh, work is contributed, especially in the upper limb uh, extremity microsurgery, uh, breast surgery, and probably tumor reconstructive surgery. And he's also, he was the recipient of the Godina International Traveling Fellowships and many awards uh, to his credits. I think it's a really honor and pleasure to have uh, Dr. Michael here. And uh, we welcome Dr. Michael um, to um, this IPL series, and uh, we invite him to give this talk uh, on the upper extremity flap and soft tissue reconstruction. Thank you very much for uh, um, accepting our invite and uh, uh, coming on, on this day to join with us. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Terence, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here, and uh, this is um, a great platform for for national and international learning and, and brings everybody together. So um, kudos to you and, and your team for putting this together and uh, really uh, look forward to, to sharing information and, and, uh, and the discussion. The, the, the talk today is basically upper extremity flaps and soft tissue reconstruction. Um, it's beyond the scope to cover all flaps and all types of reconstruction. I just want to cover basic principles and things that, that, that have certainly helped me in my career and in my approach to upper extremity reconstruction. Uh, so just tips, tips and, and, and pointers in terms of how to, how to evaluate, manage, and, um, and follow through with post-operative care. So indication for free flaps, you know, you all do free flaps and obviously um, I don't, I look at the reconstructive ladder, but I think that upper extremity is critical for, for getting patients into rehabilitation, hand therapy, and getting them mobilized as quickly as possible. You know, it's one thing to do, a, uh, you know, a flap, um, but it's another thing to basically get them into therapy and get them moving quickly. Uh, I've seen numerous occasions where patients have had a beautiful reconstruction, but they weren't placed in a, a position of function or an intrinsic plus, plus splint. And weren't mobilized early enough, and then you're you're having to deal with capsulotomies and and um, and and tenolysis and, and a lot of secondary surgeries to get them moving again. So, um, if you're going to consider a reconstruction, consider basically the reconstruction that's going to offer the best functional outcome. And sometimes that's a more complex reconstruction. Uh, anything that's going to allow patients to get mobilized as quickly as possible, I think, is absolutely critical. If you, if there's anything that you take away from this talk is that early mobilization after any kind of soft tissue reconstruction is absolutely paramount, especially especially in the upper extremity. And having a good relationship with your physical therapist to let them know what you did and how you did it and what you're thinking, I think is really important as well. When I was in Louisville, we, we had our hand therapist right next to our hand clinic and we'd walk down the hallway and talk to them right away about all their patients. Um, and whether it was a secondary procedure or a free flap. So that was really useful. So things to consider are indications, you know, revascularization when there's no local options available for coverage, um, functional reconstruction if you're going to reconstruct nerve, bone, tendons, patient patient selection and health is really important as well. There's some patients that are not candidates for free flaps. Um, having a right the right micro team I think is really critical. If you don't have the right setup or the right micro team or the right environment, probably not a good idea to to do micro. 
um, at least not yet. Um, you can do it in the future once you build your team, but um, having having the support and the and the proper equipment is obviously is obviously you know paramount. There are a lot of options you know for free flap reconstruction. Uh, I won't I won't belabor the the point here, but you know anything from skin flaps, muscle flaps, bone flaps, um, adipofascial flaps really depends on what your reconstructive goals are going to be. Um, but we can take flaps from anywhere in the body, any comp, any composition. We're really limited by um, essentially our, our experience and the donor sites available to our patients. Now, one thing that I want to touch on is is the timing of reconstruction. This is this is uh, I think um, been a, a point of um, controversy in the literature for, for for a while, but I don't think it is anymore. We did a systematic review of upper extremity free flaps and the timing of upper extremity free flaps. And we looked at the rates of total flap loss, infection, hospital stay, bony non-union um, within, within an emergency setting, so le less than 24 hours, early five days, or primary six to 21 days, or, or delayed, which is more than 21 days. Now, after after basically putting all these patients in these in these time buckets, we didn't find any significant difference in terms of flap loss infection or, bo or bony non-union. Um, obviously, there was a significant association between the timing and the length of stay. So the more you you obviously delayed the reconstruction, the longer the patients were in the hospital, admittedly, and and that makes complete sense. But the, the but the biggest takeaway message from this this talk was that or this this systematic review was that the timing of reconstruction did not impact flap loss or, or infection. And, and I think that's really important. So um, contrary to, to, to you know, previous publications uh, from Gadina, the, the upper extremity um, is pretty resilient to, um, to reconstruction in terms of timing. Uh, now, if the flap loss rate is not any higher at, at an earlier reconstruction, that's a really a great thing. So the earlier I think that you can cover the upper extremity, the better, you know, for patients that are, sitting around that are in a splint, not moving, um, and have multiple dressing changes, they're going to create a lot of, uh, you're gonna, that's going to create a lot of edema and stiffness uh, in their hand. And if they're not moving and they don't have full coverage, the swelling and the edema and the fibrosis in the wound just continues to, um, to increase, you know, exponentially. And it makes, it makes mobilization a lot more difficult. So uh, early coverage, radical debridement, serial debridement if you need to, if it's a really extensive injury and it's really contaminated, there's absolutely no problem with that. But I would say that early coverage is, is, uh, is critical if your team can, um, can support that. The, and this is our Louisville experience. So when I was a fellow in Louisville, we, we reviewed basically like the last 20 years of all free flaps uh, for the upper extremity. The majority of them were fascia cutaneous flaps, and these started out with the groin flap. Um, and the groin flap pedicle is quite small, so the, the, the flap failure rate was higher in groin flaps in the beginning. A lot of toe transfers, many of these were immediate toe transfers, and then myocutaneous flaps and muscle flaps. The fascia cutaneous flaps evolved towards the lateral arm. Louisville used the lateral arm flap for almost every soft tissue coverage. Um, and the key point here is that their, their success rate became really high. So they had a close to 95% flap survival rate. Um, and that's because of their experience. They, they, they got really comfortable doing a lot of flap, not a lot of flaps, but many micro procedures with one or two single flaps, one or two, you know, very familiar flaps. And the lateral arm was certainly one of them. So they would use it as, as um, fascial tenus flap, edible fascial flap, um, triceps tendon extension, bone from the humerus. So um, a lot of different variations and, and they knew the anatomy really well and, and their survival rate, you know, increased and soared from there. So you don't have to know, uh, you know, 20 different flaps, but, but if, you can, if you can work well and understand the, the variance of one or two flaps and apply them in, in multiple different applications, your success rate is gonna be really, really high. Um, so lateral arm and then muscle flaps like the LD and the rectus, you know, almost achieved 100% survival rate. So the timing reconstruction, so we did this study here, uh, which I mentioned previously. Um, again, just to reiterate, there, were, there was no association between the timing of reconstruction and the rates of flap loss infection or bony non-union. So that was really, really interesting. Uh, again, we, we basically showed the same thing. There's no difference whether it was 24 hours or less than two days or less than six days, six days in a week. Um, now, indications and contraindications, we talked about this a little bit. Indications, absolute would be 
exposure of, of tendon, vessels, bones, um, things that are really critical, exposed hardware, that's a relative indication, um, and then good functional outcomes that are anticipated. Early aggressive, adequate debris mod is really important. Um, and then the zone of injury, which, which is so extensive that you can't use any local or regional flaps, or, or the size of the defect is so big that you can't close, obviously, primarily. Uh, you can't use anything local or regionally. Contraindications, you know all this. Um, you know, the wound is heavily contaminated and will require serial debridement. Extensive injury um, where, you know, limb salvage is, is almost impossible. There's no micro expertise in your facility. You don't have the equipment. You don't have the team set up for that. Or the patient is really unstable. Um, and, you know, following ATLS protocol, the patient, uh, uh, the patient is hypotensive or in shock. Um, or really it's just not clinically stable for a micro, a micro, um, micro procedure. So obviously that would have to, to be done when the patient is stabilized. I can't emphasize enough the, the importance of dynamic reconstruction. So, you know, the upper extremity, un unlike the lower extremity or, or reconstructing a chest wall defect, um, the hand, you know, relies on, on, on movement and function. So it's not a static reconstruction, it's a functional dynamic reconstruction. So movement is life. Um, always think about this in the back of your mind when you're covering something. You know, if I'm going to do a flap on, on an upper extremity and it's going to go over a joint or um, it's going to go over tendons, uh, it's really important to, to consider how you're going to get the patient mobilized postoperatively. Uh, and, and I think working with your therapist, proper splinting, managing expectations with the patient, letting them know that you're going you're gonna to have them move and go to therapy very quickly after surgery is really important. And this is a point to that. So this patient here had a, a radial form flap uh, for a tumor on the dorsum of the hand, um, melanoma resection over here, and then basically um, ended up getting basically, you know, a lot of stiffness in their MCP joint and, and all of her extensor tendons basically scarred down. Now the advantage of early reconstruction is that you can close the wound earlier, there's less tissue desiccation, less risk of infection, edema, and early mobilization. So those are all things that apply, not just to trauma reconstruction, but also cancer reconstruction. The less the wound is open, the less desiccation uh, and swelling and tissue fibrosis. And if you end up doing a bunch of serial excisions uh, or debris months, that's fine, but, but keep in mind that you should get the patient moving in between the debris months and the, and the serial sessions. And also keep in mind that you're probably gonna end up with a much bigger wound when you're ready to cover then you start off initially because of just the serial debris months. You know, some of the desiccation ends up having to be resected. Um, so your wound is going to be, um, is going to be, you know, oftentimes a lot bigger. This patient here ended up getting a lot of, a lot of stiffness. And what we had to do is go back and do um, extensor tenolysis. This is a patient that came to my clinic. She had a previous radial form flap from another, um, uh, from another surgeon. And, you know, great coverage, achieved the ends and the outcome, but the patient wasn't mobilized really early enough or, or splinted in a position of function. So um, we basically re-elevated the flap. Um, I don't typically thin the flap when I re-elevate it this way. I do that later, and I'll, I'll basically make a 50% incision around the circumference and then do lipoaspiration. Or I just do lipoaspiration only if I don't need to take out any skin. Um, but here what we did is we did a wide-awake um, uh, Wallant procedure, so wide awake surgery, uh, infiltration of local anesthetic with epi. And that way, when you do your tenolysis, you can ask the patient to really flex uh, and see what, uh, what the outcome is and, and make adjustments. So this patient here, tenolysis basically of um, all of her extensors. And, and she wasn't able to basically make a full fist or touch her palm prior to this. Uh, and now, now she, now she is. So you can actually see the outcome of an aggressive tenolysis. Now she's she's going to need an MCP uh, capsulotomy as well, but we're going to do that later. Um, but again, now you can see all the, all the tendons are, are mobilized; they're all freed up, and um, it's really great to do this under wide awake surgery because because you know what the outcome is going to be uh, live. So again, this is another example of early mobilization. This is a patient when I was at Parkland, UT Southwestern. Uh, this patient had a crush injury, multiple open metacarpal fractures, um, FDP, FDS lacerations in zone three, and then also had a crush of uh, all your digital nerves, uh, radial digital nerves, soft tissue crush. 
essentially also revascularization um, of his digits. So a lot of things that are going on here, scarring in the palmar aspect of his hand. And this is essentially basically his, his hand in, in flexion and extension, basically had a frozen hand, could not do anything, um, really painful. This is a young patient. Um, so, you know, manual worker wanted to get back to work, but essentially had a, a useless, you know, um, a useless left hand, couldn't really do anything. So you've got to have a staged approach. This patient is going to need multiple surgeries and you have, you know, you have to think in the back of your mind, well, how am I going to approach this? He'll need tenolysis. He'll, he, he, he'll need, you know, flexor tendon reconstruction, soft tissue coverage or, or contracture release, uh, tenolysis, MCPs. Um, so a lot of things. Now this, you know, it's hard to say if this could have been avoided or not, but but um, there are some delayed, there are some factors that certainly contributed to this presentation, and that involves obviously delayed wound healing um, on the volar surface, um, potentially, you know, suboptimal splinting um, and extended mobilization. So injured hands swell quickly. They don't really tend to tolerate immobilization, uh, you know, very much. And when you, when, when you add all these injuries, it really compounds the problem. So we did uh, a few surgeries on him, started off with capsulotomies of the MCP joint, the PIP joint, um, tenolysis of his FDP, excises FDS. Uh, we did some stage flexor tendon reconstructions because some of his tendons just basically were not were not, not fixable. They had to be completely replaced with hunter rods and, um, uh, and palmaris reconstruction. And then pulley reconstruction as well, multiple Z-plasties, extensive rehab. Um, extensor tendon reconstruction and, and tenolysis, or, or sorry, extensor tendon subluxation and reconstruction. And then we get him into a better position, a better, a better functional state. So um, this is not something that, that can be done in one surgery. You know, it takes a, a staged approach, um, but certainly I think an, an improvement from what he had before surgery. Again, you know, this is an extreme example, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of the issues that we see in terms of stiffness can be avoided with early, early mobilization and proper splinting in a position of function after after trauma or after any flap surgery. So management of flea flap reconstruction, you know, I like to I like to look um, at this as a team approach, an orthoplastic approach. A lot of you have orthopedic orthopedics trained, orthopedic surgery trained. Um, I think the best teams are made up of orthopedic and, and plastic surgeons. Um, uh, you know, an orthoplastic approach very much, very much like we've done for um, for the lower extremity, and um, and again, limb preservation versus length preservation is another another topic as well. You know, you want to replace all functionally critical critical structures. Now, I think one of the most important things is proper debris mod. That's that's one thing that I've learned when I was in Louisville is is radical debris mod of, of the wound. We had a lot of farming injuries uh, that were heavily contaminated, and obviously, you can't cover those injuries uh, immediately. They, a lot of them had to have you know serial debris mod. Um, so that's one factor. The other one is bony st stabilization. If there's if there's multiple fractures and you have an unstable bony construct, it's it's very difficult to offer soft tissue reconstruction. So a bony platform stabilizing, putting spanning plates or uh, bridging plates, and then and then after that, offering soft you know soft tissue reconstruction, and and that can be any flap that you're really comfortable with. Um, there's some advantages and disadvantages of muscle versus fascia cutaneous, perforator versus non perforator. Um, I think the most important thing is, you know, using a flap that you feel really comfortable with and that you know really well, you know, for the best outcome. And then again, primary versus secondary reconstruction, you know, nerve tendons, um, bones, immediate bone grafting, um, um, things that, that need to be done either in a primary setting or a secondary setting have to be considered. So early reconstruction. So I think the advantages of property breed mount are really critical. That's This is something that we were we were taught to do from an early on from an early setting in our fellowship and oftentimes um, the attending would be doing the the debris mount because it's probably you know it was probably one of the most important aspects of the reconstruction um if you if you're not debriding properly you can leave behind contaminated tissue or necrotic tissue which can get infected which can compromise your reconstruction so the way that i like to look at this is very much like tissue like tumor extirpation and cancer patient, um, the debris might have started outside the zone of injury, outside the zone of trauma in, in, a, in a healthy tissue plane. And then you basically dissect and, and remove the wound itself in block pretty much. 
um, paying careful attention to preserving, you know, critical structures like tendons and nerves, uh, obviously critical vessels. Um, but taking but taking out the tumor like a like a like a tumor or taking out the, the you know the wound like a tumor helps you basically analyze what's missing and allows early reconstruction because you're not leaving necessarily any uh, any contaminants behind. So what this does is that also the anatomy becomes unscarred. You don't have that cycle of fibrosis, uh, a woody tissue environment, desiccation, and eventually potential the potential for losing more tissue because of ongoing desiccation and debridements. This is an example here. So this is a this is a 22 year old patient uh, rollover injury. Um, basically had an intact ulnar and, and, uh, and medium nerve and, and also intact ulnar artery, um, well perfused hand, um, basically had a, a segmental bone defect for, um, for his radius, um, and, um, and essentially, uh, you know, it's hard to look at this and see what's missing, but when you, when you dissect that side of the zone of injury and resect this as, a, as sort of a, a wound and you excise the wound here, you can get a better appreciation for what's missing. And, and it becomes a lot clearer. And that way you can make kind of a cookbook laundry list of things that need to be done now and things that need to be done that can wait until later. So this, I think, has really helped me in my, in my practice in terms of determining what the critical structures um, that need to be addressed immediately versus in a delayed setting and what's missing. So we, you know, essentially, we we did uh, an LT flap uh, just for soft tissue reconstruction. He had his, you know, he had bony stabilization. Uh, his ulnar was intact, so we uh, so we basically um, did soft tissue reconstruction and plan for for reconstruction of his uh, his radius in the future. Um, but again, you know, salvaging his upper extremity and not resorting to an amputation because this patient had sensation of his entire hand and was it was well perfused and refusing amputation, obviously. So another example here of post months. This is a, a classic just dorsal hand injury. Um, this can be debrided in one setting. So you can cover this in one setting, obviously. You don't need to really seal debris month. By going outside the zone of injury, you're creating a bit of a bigger wound, but you're going to cover this with a flap anyways. Uh, you're all skilled in flap coverage. So it, it doesn't really matter if you extend the size of the wound because you're going to be able to cover it no matter what. So out, outside the zone of injury, getting rid of all the necrotic tissue, saving you know critical structures like tendons behind, converts this in one step into like a healthy wound. And then you can cover this with a pedicle groin flap, with a reverse radial forearm flap, any flap you feel comfortable. Um, this patient was an ICU patient, so we um, we basically did a pedicle groin flap for him because of just um, to, to expedite his treatment and to minimize any any additional surgical trauma for him. Here's another example: a gunshot wound. Uh, this is a hand trauma, sorry, um, and and a lot of things going on. Basically contracture of, of the web space. He had a non-union of his uh, first metacarpal. Um, had a previous incision over here, over the vulgar aspect of his form. So radial form flap wasn't really an option. Uh, he had a painful hand, um, unstable first metacarpal, um, and, and wasn't able to tip pinch. Needed length extension of his, of his uh, first metacarpal, his thumb, so, um, and deepening of his first web. So what we did here was essentially used um, a replaced like with like principle. So this, so the spare part principle, we, uh, we took basically uh, part of his, his metacarpal from, um, uh, from his index and used that as a pedicle vascularized bone flap to, to reconstruct his non-union of his first metacarpal and basically you know, bring his, his thumb out to length and then deepened his web space also with a, muscle, a free muscle sparing uh, latissimus dorsi flap with a skin graft. So we we took a small skin paddle, but but did a skin graft from the skin paddle and just excised the skin paddle. That way he doesn't have a, a split thing to skin graft donor site. It's just a, a regular scar from from his uh, muscle sparing LD donor site. And then this muscle here is is really great for just filling in the empty space of his uh, first web, um, and and it really creates a nice buttress to to keep the web open and and for first web space opening and deepening the um the lateral arm flap works well for that because it has a triangular shape triangular um adipo, adipofascial um configuration to the pedicle and it, and it really fills the first web really nicely the alt does that also a small alt flap with a bit of vastus lateralis adds thickness and 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 deep coverage to the first web 
and is really nice for keeping it open. So we did this for him. And um, the muscle sparing LD is the, another example of a variant of the LD flap that you can use. So the LD can be used in multiple ways. You can use it as a full muscle flap. You can use it as a, dis, as a descending branch muscle sparing only. So the flap can be based on the descending branch of the uh, thoracodrosal artery and vein only by saving 80% of the, of the remaining LD. You can use it also as a, a, a Tdap flap as well. So you can use, there's usually a perforator that comes right over the anterior border here of the LD muscle. And that perforator is a great, great vessel for, for a Tdap flap. Um, long pedicle, you dissect this down to the, the subscapular system. So a lot of variations for this flap. Again, it, the principle comes down to understanding one or two or three flaps, but understanding their variance and all the different applications of those flaps. Uh, ALT is a great example, you know, uh, LD is a great example, um, skip flap. So this is post-operative result. The LD muscle, I think, muscle flaps of the hand tend to shrink really nicely and contour beautifully, um, sometimes even better than, than fascia retinous flaps that sometimes need to be debulked. And I like to use a sheet graft. I pie crest it a little bit, but, but I don't, I don't, um, I don't mesh it. I don't think the mesh looks really nice and it tends to contract a little bit more. So sheet grafts, I think, are, are fair a little bit better. But then he, he has uh, a healed non-union, open web space, is able to tip pinch, um, and doesn't have basically, you know, his index or his, his second rating the way. Uh, and this patient um, has much better function now. And he's happy with his reconstruction, went back to work. So the latissimus dorsi flap, like I mentioned, you know, under, if you if you know uh, the anatomy really well, you can use one flap in multiple different ways. So the LD can be split. Um, it can be used as a muscle sparing LD, either on the descending branch or even on the transverse branch. You see the transverse branch root over here. The Bunky Clinic have have uh, written some really nice papers on the on the on the transverse branch. Rudy Bunky is, is um, um, uh, Rudy Buntik has, has has published papers on that, and that's really nice for upper extremity reconstruction as well. Uh, or a TDAP flap also based on just a perforator from uh, from the TDA. So different applications. Uh, you can use it also here for functional reconstruction, for you know um, bicep tendon reconstruction and soft tissue coverage for big avulsion injuries. You can use it as a muscle sparing LD also for lateral arm coverage here. This is a, a tumor case, um, sarcoma case basically. And this is roughly 20%, 15% of the LD, 80% is left behind. Um, it gives nice, nice coverage, really, really simple flap to harvest takes, you know, 25 minutes to do this 25 minutes, just to, to elevate this 20, just to elevate the flap. You're, you're basically dopplering the descending branch, um, and keeping a one centimeter lateral to that as a security cuff, and then stopping basically your pivot point, which is right below, uh, the separation between the transverse and, and the descending branch of the TDA, um, quite a reliable flap to use. You can use it again, like I mentioned for sarcoma, it'll, it'll, it'll you know, reach quite, quite far. Um, caution, a word of caution, LD doesn't really reach the olecranon as well. Um, be careful because usually the, the olecranon uh, portion of your flap uh, tends to be hypovascularized. So um, unless you disinsert the LD, you may have a, a little bit of a problem reaching the olecranon region for elbow coverage. So just be careful about that. I want to talk a little bit about the ALT flap, which is one of my favorite flaps. Um, I think that this is this is a if you know if if you had one flap in your armamentarium, this is one that you can certainly use. Um, you can use it as in in multiple different applications. We used it for head and neck. We used it for lower extremity, upper extremity. We used it for groin reconstruction, perineal reconstruction, even abdominal wall reconstruction. Lots of applications. Um, you can use it with with only vastus lateralis. You know, you can the LCFA can be used, and you can have a small cuff of vastus lateralis for small muscle flap. Uh, take a skin graft from the from the from the thigh. You can use an uh, an, an, um, an extension of the of the flap with uh, the, the fascia lata as well for for tendon reconstruction that you can roll up and reconstruct the Achilles tendon or any other tendon. Um, but again, um, very useful flap, and I think that. Uh, there are simple ways of harvesting it. I mean, a lot of people are harvesting this flap super fascially to minimize the donor site morbidity. I don't think that's as much of a problem with uh, herniation of, uh, of the vas lateralis and, and the rectus. Um, and I'll show you some ways of basically harvesting this flap where you can, you can do a subfascial, uh, but then again, keep the fascia and, and just leave a cuff of fascia around the perforator 
uh, which can make the donor site closure a little easier. Um, uh, but again, very, very, very useful flat to harvest. It's been around for over 20 years from now and used in multiple applications. So I use this um, obviously as a fascia cutaneous flap, but you can, like I mentioned before, um, do an extension of the fascia lata and use it for fascial coverage or fascial reconstruction. Uh, you can use it also with a portion of bone from the vas lateralis. It's based off the LCFA. You're all familiar with the LT flap. But you can also harvest a very large flap. I mean, almost the the you know entire anterior thigh can be can be harvested off one one or two perforators. Um, you can take uh, fascia, nerve, muscle, split skin paddle if you have different perforators. The nerve is the um, um, descending branch or the uh, superficial femoral uh, femoral nerve, fascia cutaneous nerve. The the donor side is pretty expendable. You can take almost forty percent of the vas lateralis and not really have any problems. So I think it's useful for degloving injuries, especially when you're, you're going to have to go back and do extensor tendon reconstruction or tendon transfers. Um, you you could obviously cover this with an LD flap, but but having to re-elevate a muscle flap tends to be a little a little trickier than having to re-harvest or re-elevate a fascia cutaneous flap, especially when you're you're going to go do secondary reconstruction. So I prefer fascia cutaneous flaps in this setting. Um, and again, I harvest the flap essentially sometimes super fascially. But sometimes I'll, I'll harvest subfascially and then just keep a small cuff of fascia around the perforator and leave the rest of the fascia behind. I don't close the fascia to fascia in the donor side because post-op swelling um, is going to may create a compartment syndrome or may create some uh, muscle ischemia. So I never I never closed you know primarily. I just tack it back onto the muscle loosely uh, to account for a post-operative swelling. I think that's really important. The other thing that I don't do is I don't do spinals on ALT flaps. Because if you end up doing a spinal that lasts, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, and you end up having bleeding or some issues, uh, you can develop a compartment syndrome that's unrecognized. So I would, I would, I would avoid spinal epidurals uh, when doing a lower extremity base flap for that reason. LT flap here. So this is nice coverage. Um, you can go back and debulk this. And then if you need any secondary reconstruction, it's really easy to just re-elevate this. Um, and then do your secondary reconstruction and, and just reinset. Again, uh, debulking. If there's any debulking, uh, I'll do that at least six months after. I'll, I'll start with no incision. I'll just lipoaspirate the, the flap only. And then the skin tends to contract uh, without having to take out excess skin. If there's a lot of skin after the debulking, then I will do that. But I'll, I will only make uh, a limited incision. No more than 50% of the, of the circumference of the flap because of, of minimizing the risk of pedicle, pedicle injury or, or ischemia to the flap. Um, I think that's really important. So the LT flap design, this is a large LT flap here, but, but essentially you're marking a line from the uh, anterior superior iliac spine to the lateral superior board of the patella. And you can do that with your hands like this. So I teach my residents, you know, your, your, your small finger is going to the SIS and then the other small finger is going to the superior lateral board of the patella. And then your thumbs meeting that the midpoint is where the perforator is going to be, and you and you line this up. The axis here is basically the axis of the of the of the pedicle of the septum between the rectus femoris and the vas lateralis. Um, so the midpoint, you know, where your thumb reaches, is going to be typically where you find a perforator, and then you draw a line from the pubis to this this point over here, and that's essentially the axis of the um, uh, of the descending branch of the LCFA. So I think the the landmarks are really important when you're drawing this. You can draw a really smaller flap, smaller skin paddle. In this case, we had a bigger skin paddle because of just the, the size of the defect. But you can draw, you know, a skin paddle that's like six centimeters by six centimeters, depending on what your defect is. I like to make larger, larger incisions for exposure because um, sometimes the perforator is here, but sometimes you have also a direct fascia cutaneous perforator that's going to the TFL an oblique branch, which is non-muscular and very easy to dissect. And, um, and if your skin paddle is too small, you might be missing that, that perforator. So it gives me more options. I like to have a little bit bigger of a skin, a skin paddle. It just uh, allows us to explore the perforator anatomy a little bit better. So here's just an example, landmarks, um, anatomy and design. The, uh, the SI, you draw a line essentially from the SIS all the way up to the lateral board of the patella. And this is the, the, the septum between the rectus femoris and the vas lateralis. You draw another line from the perforator here all the way up to the midpoint 
of a line between the SIS and the tubercle of the pubis. So this midpoint here is the descending branch of the uh, LCA, of the, of the um, um, lateral circumflex femoral artery. And then again, you can also draw an extension of the TFL. If you need fascia, you can take fascia here from the, t from the uh, fascia lata as an, extent, an extension to the flap. And that, that uh, fascia um, can be really well vascularized as well. So the, uh, the sequence is basically identifying the septum between the rectus femoris and the vas lateralis. Personally, I like to do this more distally. Here's the, the knee, here's the patella over here. Um, I think it's much easier to do that laterally, or not laterally, but distally than it is proximally. So here it is. It's basically this, uh, you, you'll see you know, a line of fat, uh, a linear line of fat between, uh, between both muscles. Um, gliding properties for the fat, gliding properties for where, where you know, vessels travel. And then you open up the, the septum between the rectus femoris and vas lateralis from distal to proximal uh, with bovi cautery. That can be done pretty quickly. And then again, here it is. Um, you'll see this, this fascial layer right over here. This is a yellow, you know, fat layer, which is the septum. Rectus femoris gets opened up, and then you can sweep this medially over here, and then you sweep the vas lateralis laterally, open up this little fascial layer right up here all the way. So you can see it's a lot easier to do this distally than it is proximally over here. Um, and then again, once this is all open, uh, you reflect the rectus femoris medially, and then you're going to, so here's the rectus femoris up here, uh, that gets retracted immediately, and then you can see the descending branch of the LCFA, and then and then you can have a look and see you know where all your perforators are. So here we see nice perforator coming from uh, the LCFA. This is going right to the junction here of the tension fascia lata and and the uh, um, and the skin paddle, the fascia. So um, this is an oblique branch, and this oftentimes has a very limited muscular course, so a lot easier to dissect compared to like a long intramuscular course to the vas lateralis. So if I see something like this, I'll, I'll opt basically for the short oblique course all the time. Um, you may have a little bit of a shorter pedicle, but you know usually it's at least six, seven centimeters. And again, um, this is the perforator here, uh, vas lateralis, rectus femoris. Preserve the motor branch of the femoral nerve during your dissection. But this gives you a long pedicle. Uh, and again, this is harvested subfascially. But if you want to preserve the fascia, one thing that you can do is once the perforator is dissected, you can cut a, a small fascial rim right around the perforator, you know, usually about three or five centimeters, and keep all this fascia intact. So when you're elevating the skin paddle, just, just elevate, it up, elevate it suprafascially, so above the fascia for this portion over here, but then do it subfascially when you're uh, when you're on the perforator, just keep a cup of, of fascia around the perforator. And then the rest of this fascia here can be tacked down to the, the vas lateralis or the rectus femoris. Um, again, like I mentioned, don't close primarily and close to the other, other fascial border. Just tack it on the muscle uh, to account for post-operative swelling. So here's a degloving injury, right upper extremity, exposed tendons. Um, this patient needs to go to rehab, needs to be splinted properly. All this is debrided. Um, outside the zone of injury, um, just like a tumor. So you convert this into a clean wound, cover with an LT flap and get the patient moving. Uh, you can do debulking injury, debulking procedures later. Um, and again, this patient had, you know, good function and went back to work after, after all this. Uh, degloving injuries here. This is an example of an exposed medium nerve. Um, exposed joints, some tendons that are exposed here as well. You could argue that a lot of this can be skin grafted proximally and you, and you could use just a smaller flap basically for the, for the wrist coverage to avoid contracture um, and to provide good nerve coverage. Um, but for the, sake, for the sake of just simplicity, you know, we used a bigger skin paddle just to cover the entire defect as a, as a single aesthetic unit. Uh, so we're not breaking things down. I think it looks better. But again, you could have just covered this with a skin graft proximally and just a flap uh, for the critical area over here. Uh, he has an X fix, so this patient is going to need to be mobilized um, as quickly as possible, at least for his MCP and his, and his IP joints. But again, ALT flap, um, good coverage, um, very reliable. And if you need to go back and do anything in the future, you can just re-elevate this fat retinous flap. Uh, quite simply, and 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 then um, do your secondary reconstruction where there's tendon nerves or or anything else. Crushed injury. We talked about this already. Radical debridement. Here's the descending branch again. So here's the vas lateralis, uh, intermuscular septum between the vas lateralis and the rectus. Um, these are not, two nice perforators that are not intramuscular, um, and and this allows you to basically 
assess the, the perforator anatomy quite easily. There's also a lot of perforators that go to the rectus femoris, and you can use these branches as, as just a composite flap for this flap and just use a small, small branch perforator going to a muscle. If you need a little bit of muscle, you can use that for dead space obliteration uh, when you're doing soft tissue coverage. Or sometimes you just need a small cup of muscle. And my preferred, my preferred flap, if I need a little bit of muscle, isn't the gracilis, it's the vas lateralis because the, the, the muscle is expendable up to 40%. You, the perforator is quite big and the pedicle is, is really massive. I mean, the pedicle, an LCFA pedicle is, is quite long and the artery and the vein are big as well. So it, and it's super easy to harvest. The donor side morbidity is pretty minimal. Um, so if I need a small cup of muscle only, I tend to go to the vas lateralis uh, and split the vas lateralis and just use a, a small portion of it. Again, um, this is actually one of the first ALTs that we did in Louisville. Um, this patient had um, all neuropathy, had big neuromas of the ulnar nerve. So we did we did serial nerve grafts, cable serial nerve, nerve, nerve grafts, and an LT flap for coverage. And we actually harvested this flap super fascially. Um, uh, Really not not knowing the difference and and just these were the, the early years of of uh, ALT flap uh, in Louisville. Um, we did it super fastly, which was was interesting. But um, this patient had a good outcome and and uh, had stable coverage. Um, and I think that's really important. Anybody that has a nerve injury um, is going to need soft tissue coverage, nerve resection, reconstruction, either nerve transfers, uh, cable grafts. But by doing the nerve surgery, soft tissue coverage becomes, um, you know, critical because without good good vascularity to to your nerve repair, uh, you're not going to have good nerve function. So uh, those things become really critically important. Plus, also mechanical protection, you know, of your nerve repair is is also really important. Also, um, word of caution to electrical burn injuries: what you see isn't always what you get. So this this patient here had, had electrical burn injury. This was a referral from ortho. From orthopedic colleagues and um, the extent of injury is much much greater than this so when harvesting a flap uh, i'll design the skin paddle only after i've done the resection of the of the of the of the wound and then whether that's a tumor or whether that's an electrical burn injury or any trauma uh, always har i always harvest the the skin paddle design uh, and more after after the the final resection of the trauma or or the burn injury or the tumor defect, because it, it ends up being much bigger than you initially uh, anticipate, especially burn injuries also, because you're going to get secondary distension and retraction of the skin because of just the, 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 the non-elasticity of, of the soft tissue. Uh, it'll be it'll basically stretch very rigid, so the defect ends up being much bigger. Um, so wait until you design your final flap design, uh, until your final defect has been measured. And then I designed a flap that's a little bit bigger than that as well, just to account for the insetting. Because if it's just if it's if it's a one-to-one -one ratio between the flap and the defect, and you have a relatively thick flap, it'll be hard to inset the flap. So I make the flap a little bit bigger, and then I thin the periphery of the flap so that we have a nice contour and there's not a pin cushioning deformity when the, the flap is inset into the recipient site. And I elevate the borders of the recipient site as well to have a uh, a nicer uh, a nicer insetting. So here, long pedicle, ALT is a big advantage to this because you can get outside the zone of injury and burn injury. And you can see here that this, this defect was much greater than the initial presentation. Thin ALT flap, you can thin the periphery here. You can see that we debulked it pretty considerably, kept a cuff of five centimeters around the perforator. Um, and again, long, long, long pedicle. You can get really outside the zone of injury for this patient here. Um, we talked about this. Here are the landmarks. This is just another example for, for repetition. Um, the septum here is really obvious, obvious between the rectus femoris and the vas lateralis, fat pad distally, which is easily identifiable. And then you take your bovine and just open up the whole septum from distal to proximal. And then after that, sweep the rectus femoris immediately. And then you see the descending branch of the LCFA. And then again, you can identify the perforator anatomy over here coming down. So this allows you to quickly see which perforator you're going to, you're going to select. Um, and then uh, you can you can harvest fascial lata and extension with your flap as needed. Sometimes there are branches that are going right to the rectus femoris or uh, to deeper muscles that you can use for uh, a composite flap as well. So here, this perforator was uh, had a limited intramuscular course. Uh, you're dissecting this down to um, to the skin paddle, and then word of caution. Um, 
try to preserve the branch of the rectus femoris. There's, there's a proximal and, and more of a distal branch over here, but, but if you ligate and, and clip both those branches, you can easily devascularize the rectus femoris and end up with some, um, you know, a devascularized rectus. So, so if you're going to do that, be careful that you preserve at least the proximal branch. Clamp, clamp the, the, the branch that you're going to clip if you want to have a longer pedicle, and just make sure that the rectus femoris is well vascularized by the more proximal rectus branch. Uh, before you do that. Um, and then again, once you've dissected the perforator and everything else, you can commit to your circum circumferential incision. Now, one way, if you're, if you're not doing a suprafascial dissection and you're starting out, one way that you can, you can minimize that um, and save fascia is um, keep a five centimeter cup of fascia around the perforator or even less than that, depending on the size of the, per of, of the skin pedal. And then elevate your skin pedal over here above the fascia. So instead of cutting the fascia here, just Elevate the skin pedal and use your bovi and keep the fascia uh, intact and just elevate the skin off the fascia here and then retack this fascia back down to the donor site. Um, again, this is an example of a fascia ladder that you can that you can use in extension and this can be rolled up onto itself. I've done this for Achilles reconstruction. I, I've done this for um, extensor tendon reconstruction. You roll it up and it becomes a vascularized a vascularized uh, tendon graft. Um, here we used it basically to cover a plate. This patient had a rollover injury. Uh, we fused his wrist, um, had, you know, multiple extensor tendon grafts. So we covered the plate with uh, fascia lata and then his LT flap over his tendon, had him moving. You know, he scarred down obviously and needed tenolysis wide awake. Um, so we got that, you know, we got that done. Um, not a perfect result. This is his result here. Um, it's not, it's not perfect. He had some malrotation here of, um, of his long finger, but was, was able to go back to work and, and be functional. We did some secondary reconstruction on him to fix that. Um, a great little flap. If you have a small hand defect that needs, you know, deep, deep space coverage with a skin graft, you can just harvest a small cuff of, um, of vas lateralis, really simple to harvest, well vascularized. Um, and the donor site morbidity from a small size like this is, is, is minimal. Um, you can also harvest it with a sensory branch of the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Just let the patients know that, you know, that's, they're going to have, they'll be insensate for that portion of, the, of their thigh. Obviously, you're taking skin, so it's going to be insensate anyways. But, but you, can, you can take um, this nerve as a, uh, as a sensory nerve to, to provide sensory re especially if you're doing heel coverage or um, you know, pressure point coverage. And again, composite LT flap, uh, rectus femoris, um, vas lateralis, um, and you can harvest it, you know, off other pedicles as well. Um, and here's basically the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve as well. So like I mentioned before, you know, understanding one or two flaps, but using them in like multiple combinations will allow you to cover just about anything you need um, and, and have a high success rate. And then again, the the donor site avoid epidurals. Um, some patients, there have been some reports in literature of compartment syndromes with epidurals and ELT flaps that have had hematomas that were unrecognized, or and and developed compartment syndromes. So just just be mindful of that. Um, my my approach to to perforator selection um, is really simple. Um, if if I I look for perforators, I start with an anterior incision and look for perforators uh, in the LT territory. Um, and if I can't find any perforators, whether it's a centrally located, located perforator or the perforator that's the oblique branch that goes to the junction of the tensor fascia lata and the vas lateralis, then I'll, I'll look towards the rectus femoris perforators. Uh, I'll look for a medial thigh perforator from the rectus femoris. And, and if there's none, if there's no perforators that are really adequate, uh, I'll consider actually doing just a muscle flap from the vas lateralis. So if the defect is amenable to a muscle flap in a skin graft, I don't look towards necessarily the other thigh. Uh, I'll just use a, a, a muscle sparing vas lateralis and, uh, and a skin graft from the skin paddle. I'll diphthalize and, use, and harvest the skin graft with the dermatome from the skin paddle, paddle that I would have taken from the LT flap. That way, when you close, you have a linear scar and you don't have a skin, you know, split thick the skin graft donor site. Now, if, and it, but if I do need a fascia retinus flap, then I'll just potentially go to the other thigh and uh, start over again in the other thigh. So key points, I think the LT is a really safe, reliable flap. Um, the same can be said for any other flap that you understand really well. The LD is another example. Um, it's, 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 it can be used in multiple different variations. 
Um, you can convert it to a, a, a you know a muscutinous flap or a muscle flap only with a split thin skin graft if you don't have any perforators like I just mentioned and you don't need a, a skin panel, you need muscle only. Uh, has the advantage of having a long, large diameter pedicle, lots of you know variations with this flap. And I think the donor site morbidity is quite is quite low. If you look at all, all the major cancer centers, Sloan Kettering, uh, MD Anderson, um, Anna Farber, I mean, BLT flap is certainly one of the one of the key flaps that they use for extremity, sarcoma, um, head and neck, um, upper lower extremity free flap reconstruction. And the same thing as well with uh, with uh, with trauma, upper extremity trauma. The skip flap is another great flap also for extremity trauma. The donor side morbidity is, is expendable. It's well hidden. The pedicle is long. The diameter of the pedicle, the size of the pedicle is not as is not as big. The artery and the vein are smaller. Um, but you can you can use it with with muscle with with bone uh, fascia. So it has a lot of advantages as well, uh, and allows you to do perforator perforator surgery also um, in the in the extremities. So again, key points here, determining the size of the flap only after the resection. So this is a patient that had a burn injury. Um, this is a case that I had when I was in Louisville, when I was a staff. Um, resect all this, and then once you do capsulotomies, the defect is three times bigger. So if you were gonna harvest a flap based on just this anticipated resection here, you'd be pretty, you'd be pretty disappointed after your capsulotomy and your soft tissue release because all this is gonna stretch and extend after you release after you release the burn scar, um, so so do this this uh, do your final flap design only after your final resection. Lateral arm flap is really reliable. Um, this is a flap that we did all the time at, at uh, in Louisville, um, and again, um, soft tissue coverage. You can go, you, you can you can basically we we would you know anastomose to the 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 snuff box, the real artery in the snuff box. Um, and use local vein, uh, so we wouldn't sacrifice a real artery. Lateral arm flap is really dependable. Um, basically, based off the real collateral artery, um, uh, the posterior radial collateral artery, and you can see perforators that are going to the the posterior radial collateral artery. And sometimes you have different perforators, and it allows you to split the skin paddle in half and use one for the volar surface of the hand, and then you tunnel the other skin paddle through the volar surface for the dorsal surface. If you have a gunshot wound, or you can split the flap in half based on two perforators to make it wider for total dorsal hand coverage, you can harvest part of the triceps tendon with it as well. You can harvest part of the humerus bone with it as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very reliable flap. The pedicle length is usually about six to seven centimeters. But this is the harvest of this flap is very similar to harvest of any other flap um, or perforator flap. The, the easiest way is to start over the triceps tendon because that's really kind of an, ev an ev avascular plane. There's not a lot of adhesions um, and the flap is elevated quickly there. And then you start seeing the arborization of the perforators going to the posterior radial collateral artery. And the perforators will always basically tell you where to go. The perforators lead you to the main pedicle. So, and that goes for any flap or any flap harvest, whether it's a perforator flap or not. Look at the perforators and then follow them down, and that'll tell you where the main pedicle is. Um, again, here, these two beautiful perforators. You can, you can also split this flap in half right in the middle here and have two skin pedals based off these two perforators. Um, you can harvest, like I mentioned, part of the, part of the, 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 the triceps tendon, just a portion of it, uh, but this flap, uh, quite reliable. Uh, we're going back to bony stabilization. I think whenever you consider soft tissue coverage of the upper extremity, providing bony stabilization uh, is the first step. It's key for soft tissue coverage, uh, provides a stable platform for reconstruction, and also, more importantly, for early mobilization. So this patient had a metacarpal fracture here. We, uh, we did a spanning plate, um, bone graft, uh, pedicle radial form flap, and then went back later and did some lipoaspiration just for debulking a little bit, and the patient had... A uh, good function, and I think uh, a reasonable uh, cosmetic result. Um, Lou, uh, Louis Shecker was really a pioneer and, and, and a master in immediate reconstruction and popularized uh, emergency free flaps uh, for the upper extremity. So this is a, a, um, a crush injury with multiple metacarpal fractures and segmental bone loss, sensor tendon loss here. Um, this is one of Louis Shecker's cases uh, when I was a fellow. And again, you can do um, segmental bone grafting, spanning plate, use AO principles for this, uh, putting basically the metacarpals out to length. 
And this allows you to do soft tissue reconstruction. You know, whether you're going to do immediate tendon reconstruction, um, that's that's basically a surgeon surgeon preference depends on patient factors and and what you're comfortable doing. Um, but bony stabilization is a piece paramount for doing any any early soft tissue coverage. So here, these are really old plates. We don't use these plates obviously anymore, but the principles remain the same: plating the metacarpals. Um, and then basically extends your tendon grafts that can be passed through the fascia and through the adipose tissue of your flap. And this is a, a, a lateral arm flap for, for soft tissue coverage. You can use an ALT flap. You can use any flap that you're really comfortable with. Um, but if you're going to pass tendons through the, through the flap, you know, fascia retainous flap is critical, is important. And then this is a, a really nice result, eight months post-op. Phenomenal function and great outcome uh, for this patient. Chimeric flaps are really, are, I think, are important as well. Sometimes you have circumferential defects, and um, the LD donor side, the subscapular system, is really, really useful. You can do a periscapular scapular flap, an LD flap, a serratus flap in combination, and cover almost a circumferential defect in the form. Uh, so think about, you know, chimeric flaps as well when you're, when you're, uh, when you're offering reconstruction. You may have to do more than two flaps, uh, and this is just, you know, dorsal volar coverage. Um, the, the fascia retainous portion of the flap can be placed over anticipated secondary reconstruction. So if you're going to have to go back and re-elevate a flap, put the skin flap where you're going to re have to re-elevate the flap um, as opposed to the volar surface where you're not, you're not anticipating any tendon reconstruction. Um, talked about bony stabilization. This is just an example of that. So this patient here, rollover injury, was coming back from his um, military uh, uh, overseas leave. Uh, and when he was driving back from the airport, he rolled over his, uh, his Humvee and had his hand sticking out of the window and had a dorsal degloving injury. So wiped out all his extensor tendons, 50% uh, of all his carpal bones, 50% um, of his metacarpal. So we did a, basically a wrist fusion, reconstructed, reconstructed his extensor tendons, um, reconstructed his uh, dorsal capsule, uh, his DRUJ. Um, and then, like I mentioned previously, fascia was used to, to cover his joint. We did tendon grafts, soft tissue coverage, had him moving early, had to do tenolysis. That's almost anticipated for these patients, and we tell them that all the time. Um, and then basically, um, I showed this result earlier, went on to uh, go back to work in the military. Some other procedures to correct his malrotation, but he, uh, he ended up doing... Uh, Doing well. Linking vessels and splitting flaps. This is an example here of a, a micro CT scan of an ALT flap. And you can see that there's interperforator flow between these different perforators, a lot of linking vessels within the fascia cutaneous flap. Um, and you see this just as much in muscle flaps. So that allows you to just to basically split flaps uh, actually to, um, to get different uh, coverage um, endpoints. So here's an ALT flap that we split in half. Here's a pedicle groin flap. So you can, you can split a pedicle groin flap for just a small portion for combined dorsal thumb coverage and dorsal hand coverage uh, because of the axiality and all the interconnecting branches um, for vascularity. Muscle flaps as well. You can take an LD flap and, and split it in multiple segments because of the rich intramuscular connections. So if you have two defects, you can take a muscle flap and split it in half and basically tunnel one to cover another defect and tunnel another one to cover another defect. Um, a, lot of, a lot of variability in, in doing that because of just the rich interconnections within the flaps themselves. So it's just a point to, a point to basically um, uh, mention that is uh, a groin flap. So this patient, you know, of his third, fourth, fifth um, uh, metacarpal, and uh, this was a, a chemical explosion at work. He was a manual worker. So a pedicle groin flap for him. Uh, but then you can go back and you can uh, desyndactylize his flap. And then once that's done, you can go back and debulk it and do lipoaspiration. And once that's, uh, that's done, you can fit him with prosthetics. So he, he worked in the public eye as well and was really conscious of, of, of having uh, prosthetics. Um, so because of the rich blood supply and interconnections, you can do this in, in a stage fashion, delayed stage, stage fashion, so you don't devascularize the groin flap but end up having, um, I think, a better cosmetic outcome um, uh, after desyndactylizing and, uh, and debulking his digits. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch over to pedicle flaps. We're gonna, I will end with a few pedicle flaps that are really, I think, useful for hand coverage. We talked about free flap, some of the basic principles, but I just wanna mention the quaba flap. This is one of my favorite flaps. 
um, for MCP coverage, PIP coverage, volar coverage of, of, uh, of P1, even P2. It'll even reach basically the DIP joint if you if you cut the perforator and, and um, allow this flap to be vascularized by uh, dorsal branches of the uh, ulnar radial proper proper dorsal uh, or ulnar or, or radial uh, proper digital artery. So essentially, it's based off a of perforator from the dorsal metacarpal artery right over here, and this perforator is found just distal to the junction of tendon and I. So these per the multiple perforators are coming off here the the, uh, the dorsal metacarpal artery. Um, it's a great flap to harvest. And, and we'll, this flap is essentially a pedicle perforator flap. Um, and you can use this for, again, it's great for MCP coverage. It's great for PIP coverage. And you're using the laxity of the dorsum of the hand. So there's a lot of laxity here. So the donor side is very, is very amenable for this, flight, th this flap. You can close primarily most of the time. Now, the anatomy of our foot is very similar to that. When, when I was in, in Mayo, we did a study looking at the vascular anatomy of the, the dorsal metac metatarsal artery. And um, sure enough, the anatomy is very similar. The perforator anatomy is very similar. You've got these perforators that are, that are coming off the dorsal metatarsal artery, very similar to the metacarpal artery here. And you can use this as a, uh, you know, a, a, a quabble flap for the foot for, um, for IP coverage, uh, which is what we did. So very useful for small defects in, in the foot as well. Here's a defect here. So this is um, uh, trauma to P1, proximal phalanx of the long finger, uh, left hand. So we debride this resection, close, you know, fix the extensory tendon uh, injury here, uh, primary approximation. And then you can do a nice quabble flap for coverage, get these patients moving quickly. Um, very useful for, for coverage. Uh, you can also do an extended quabble flap. So this is what I mentioned. The, 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 this quabble flap here, this is, a, I think, a five-year-old girl had burn injury or crush injuries, um, avulsion injuries to uh, distal tip of the lung in the ring. And you can actually cut the perforator. This is the, the perforator that's originally based of, you know, for this flap. But you can cut it and base, off, and base the flap vascularity off um, reverse flow from the uh, ulnar proper um, uh, or radial proper digital arteries. So you you keep a, this is the, the juncture I tend to here's the perforator coming right over here. You can cut that perforator, but then you keep blood supply from, uh, you, you keep a rich adipofascial cuff of tissue, and then you're getting dorsal branches from the, the ulnar and the radial uh, digital artery um, to vascularize this flap. And then it'll actually reach the DIP joint. And that's what we did for this burn contracture here. This patient had a DIP joint open wound that wouldn't, that wouldn't heal. Um, not amenable to a skin graft or anything like that. So you can actually take a flap from a previously skin grafted donor site um, and, and basically do an extended quabble flap like we just mentioned and cover the DIP joint and, and part of the PIP joint quite, uh, quite simply. Pedicle flaps off previously skin grafted sites, I think, are not a problem. The skin graft survived in the first place, so the, the tissue underneath is well vascularized. If it wasn't well vascularized, um, you know, then the skin graft wouldn't have survived. And you can confirm that with Doppler. Uh, you can confirm the pedicle and then the perforator with a, with a Doppler, Doppler um, or ultrasound or any, any, any device that you feel comfortable using. You can use it also as a composite uh, flap and, and uh, use uh, part of the EIP with your flap for extension, extensory reconstruction, extensory reconstruction here. Um, again, this perforator is found just distal to the juncture I tend and I, and then you can harvest a vascularized tendon for um, tendon reconstruction and soft tissue reconstruction. Other flaps that, that I like using are freestyle adipofascial flap for, for coverage in the upper extremity. Whether it's, it's covering basically MCP joints, you can take the fascia off of the intrinsic muscles and basically use it as a turnover flap to cover an extensor tendon um, and, and then skin graft over that. And that, that solves uh, a big problem really, really, really simply. You know, so you can take a lot of fascia off of the intrinsics, flip it over, cover, you know, a tendon, and then you're having, you're, you're, you're essentially, um, you're converting a, you know, a slightly bigger problem into a really small, small problem. Adipofascial flaps can be based off these perforators here. You don't have to scalinize these perforators. You can just rotate this adipofascial tissue into place to cover any exposed tendon or bone, and then skin graft uh, the flap itself. VY flaps, really important. Um, uh, this is basically just a VY triangular advancement flap. Um, the only points of, of mention here is that when you're, when you're advancing this flap, these flaps can be killed very easily if you advance this under tension. So taking a 15 blade and pushing down on, um, on the ligamentous attachments 
um, I think is really important. That, that will allow the, the, the triangular flap to advance uh, almost one centimeter. But releasing all of all of the ligamentous attachments, I think, is really, really, really important. Um, and then I, I overcorrect because they're going to contract down with healing and you can get a hook nail deformity. So I tend to overcorrect the flap and bring it up a little bit higher than I need to to account for some contraction. Um, another flap is a homo digital flap as well. I love these flaps. Uh, you're replacing like with like. It's, it has um, a great sensation, two point, immediate two point discrimination. And then you, you essentially elevate this flap all the way up to sometimes the MCP joint, uh, the palmar surface to get good advancement. And you can make, um, you can make triangular uh, extensions to avoid contracture. So avoid, avoid a straight line and oblique line because you, you can easily get a, a, a contracture. Um, so there's some modifications that you can do where you do wide triangular cuts um, to avoid that. I think that's, that's really important as well. Um, you don't want to necessarily scalenize the pedicle to avoid to avoid vasospasm, but the advantage of this flap is that you get up to a centimeter more of advancement. You're replacing like with like, and then this patient gets immediate tip pinch, two point discrimination, and good coverage. I think it's really critical in manual workers. Um, really like doing this flap, cross finger flap, uh, radial donor site. I I tend to basically extend this flap in a in a radial direction like this to get a longer a longer flap, a longer reach. Um, simple flap to harvest. Um, you can use it for volar coverage, dorsal coverage. If you're using a, if you're using it for dorsal coverage, you'll you'll do a, a reverse cross finger flap. But it's great for volar coverage here. Um, again, you're just elevating this uh, off the extensor tendon. Keep the parathena off the extensor tendon so you don't desiccate the tendon because you'll have to skin graft. I tend to skin graft before I insert the flap. I think that's a little bit easier. Um, and then this flap is used for volar coverage. And, and again, um, I think the donor side is uh, quite acceptable and the recipient side is acceptable as well when you, go, when you go back and divide an inset. I don't divide an inset any earlier than three weeks. I think you, you might be playing some risks. Um, and you can see them, you can clamp the, the, uh, the flap with a pickup or hemostat very lightly so it's not crushed it in clinic. Um, just to, to assess for vascularity to see if it's ready to be uh, to be uh, separated, and usually for me that's minimum of three weeks. I don't like to separate them earlier than that. And and if for older patients, I get them actually moving even with their cross finger flap. I get them moving in therapy so they don't get too stiff. Um, lateral finger flaps I think are are are, are great little flaps for burn contractures. Uh, these are random pattern flaps uh, on the side wall here. Um, and again, you're elevating a little triangular flap and just rotating it in place uh, for contraction release. I think it works great in kids uh, that have treadmill burn injuries. Uh, and again, you can use one from the sidewall. There's a lot of laxity over here and great little flap, easy to harvest for a contraction release. You can harvest it on both sides too and do a, a double uh, VY lateral flap. Uh, if you need to. Reverse cross finger flap I just mentioned. This is uh, basically a dorsal defect, uh, exposed the IP joint, so you can harvest um, like you would a cross finger flap, but you're elevating the skin um, and, uh, and then you're basically elevating the adipofascial flap in, in, a, in, a, in an opposing uh, direction. So the pivot point for the skin is going to basically be um, the radial side, but the pivot point for the adipofascial flap is going to be the ulnar side right over here. Uh, and that gets rotated into place. Your skin paddle that you elevated gets set back down in the, into the donor side for coverage, and then you can cover the um, reverse uh, adipofascial flap with either a split thickness skin graft or, or, or a full thickness skin graft. You can also take portion, a portion of, of the skin here um, um, to, um, to recreate the distal portion um, of the digit as well. Uh, the epinechium is so that's useful as well. Moberg flap, you all know how to do a Moberg, Moberg flap. Um, again, dual blood supply for the dorsum and the volar surface for the thumb. So you can take both, um, both digital arteries. Um, again, this gets elevated right off the FPL, flexor tendon. And these triangular flaps here can be used and rotated in place to avoid a skin graft uh, for the donor site when you're advancing this. So I do this on both sides if I need to. Uh, I don't like to skin graft the donor site. It, it, it can the vessels are exposed and you can get a contraction. So I, I like to use this little triangular flap for for coverage. And again, you know, this here it heals by secondary intention and resurfaces and remolds really nicely. So I don't close this. I just let this heal by secondary intention.
uh, when you're creating better better pulp and better um, better coverage. This is this patient here uh, had a, a mobile flap because of um, instability to his di distal thumb. He had a you know unstable coverage. Bone was just right underneath his skin, very painful. So he needed basically good two point discrimination, good padding. So Mobert flap worked well for him. Radial artery pedicle perforator flap. You're all super familiar with the radial artery. They're they're perforators that are found almost 100 percent within one or two centimeters from the radial styloids. So you can harvest this flap as an edipofascial fascial flap for small defects off just these perforators off the radial artery. You can see how massive they are, and this gets rotated into place, and then you can use a split th thickness skin graft for coverage and enclose the donor site primarily. Or you can harvest this as an edipofascial fascial flap or a, um, a fascia retinus flap as well, super fascially, save the fascia and save the, uh, the radial artery. And this is just an example here, dorsal defect exposed at EPL. So we just harvested a super fascial pedicle perforator flap off the radial artery. Um, this gets tunneled into place and then, uh, and offers uh, great soft tissue coverage. You could have done this also with an uh, edipofascial fascial flap, but with exposed tendon, I, I prefer to use a skin flap. Radial form flap for Failed thumb replant. This is um, failed thumb replant. Dorsal skin's not really good anymore, but he did have some volar skin that was still intact and sensate. Um, so the rail form flap is great for that. Again, freestyle pedicle perforator flaps in the upper extremity. I think there, there are so many perforators in the upper extremity. Um, this is just a PIA, posterior interosseous artery per, uh, perforator flap. So you can take your Doppler, identify Doppler within, within the axis of all the major vessels. So if you look at all the major vessels, whether it's the radial artery, ulnar artery, posterior interosseous artery, you draw a line uh, along the axis and then take your Doppler, you'll find, you know, usually major perforators along, along the artery. If the artery is very superficial, it's really, it's harder to do that because then you're getting a signal from the source artery, not the perforator, but oftentimes you can get a, you can get a perforator signal and that can tell you um, where your pivot point is going to be for your, your pedicle perpeter flap. Lastly, this is just the last example, um, flow through flaps. So this is an exposed flexor tendon injury, um, near vascular bundle. So this patient had a reconstruction with just a, a flow through arterial venous flap. So we arterialize this, this venous flap, um, skin is taken from the forearm. Yeah, you can, you can basically do a superficial dissection, skin graft the donor site. And this serves the purpose of revascularizing a digit um, and also providing soft tissue coverage. So nice useful flap for, for coverage as well. Um, donor cell morbidity is pretty minimal. Something to think about as well. So post-operative care, just to, to, to basically finish off, and this, this applies for, for free flaps, but also for pedicle flaps. I think educating your nurse is really important. Um, having in, in America, in our American hospitals, we see a lot of nursing turnover because of just um, traveling nurses that come from, you know, different hospitals are not familiar with, with, with flap coverage or flap monitoring. So educating your nurse is really important. I have, I have an in-service, uh, you know, in the next few weeks for multiple nursing teams for that very reason. Flap monitoring, flap checks uh, can be done any, any, any way that you feel comfortable either clinical only or STO2 monitoring, cap refill, color, temperature, um, whatever modality you feel comfortable and, and, and is reliable in your unit. Um, ERAS, standardized protocol, enhanced recovery after surgery, I think is important. So patients aren't taking a bunch of narcotics and end up having um, delayed hospitalization or delayed mobilization. So a combination of, uh, you know, acetaminophen, uh, anti-inflammatories, we use a lot of gabapentin and also um, um, muscle relax muscle relaxers as well. Um, and we also, you know, use, uh, immunonutrition prior to surgery to optimize their wound healing, avoid compressive dressings, look for early signs of venous congestion, hematomas, uh, arterial, arterial thrombosis and flap donor site care as well. Be careful, you know, look at the donor site again, like I mentioned for the LT, you can have some, some major complications if you're not paying attention to the donor site, same thing with the, uh, the LD donor site. So, Obviously, proper attention to all all areas. Splinting in a position of function, I think, is critical. So, if if like I mentioned before, position of function, um, so that you're stretching out all the collateral ligaments and you're not having contractory issues later on, and then working with your therapist to maximize range of motion after surgery, I think, is really is absolutely critical for uh, for the best functional outcomes. So, key points to take away. Um, 
uh, property debridement, I think, is essential for anything, whether you're doing a trauma case or a tumor case, um, doing mic micro outside the zone of injury. This, that is a point of debate. Um, some people will argue that you don't have to do that as long as the vessels look good. You can go distal to the zone of injury, and we do that all the time for lower extremity reconstruction because the vessels are more superficial uh, and they look just perfectly fine. So that's a point of debate, but in general, outside the zone of injury is preferred. Select a, a flap that you're comfortable with. So you don't have to know a million flaps, just know a few that, that you are really comfortable and learn to use them in multiple different ways. Um, standardize your post-operative flap monitoring and protocol. It makes it easy for you, for your staff, for your nurses, for your residents, for everybody. And again, start early range of motion to, um, to maximize function and avoid uh, contractures. So thank you very much. Um, uh, I really appreciate your, your time and your energy. It's been a long talk. Um, this is my email. If anybody wants to reach, reach out to me, I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide any, any information. And um, um, I look forward to, to hearing any questions if you have any questions. Um, again, thank you very much for your, for your time and, uh, and attention. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for this um, you know, outstanding um, uh, talk on this uh, reconstruction of the upper limb. Uh, right from uh, using the free flaps, uh, particular flaps, flow through flaps, and also perforative flaps. I think uh, uh, we just need to give a break of uh, to have a cup of water or coffee so that we can have yeah. some discussions. Please, please uh, take a break. Uh, we have a lot of questions um, coming from the Facebook and the Instagram users because they they, they like to watch uh, this movie, this uh, this uh, program through YouTube so that they can watch it at their convenience time. So I've just been getting a lot of questions uh, to my uh, uh, Insta and Facebook account. Uh, what we can do is we can take a couple of questions and then probably we can uh, uh, get questions replied or directed to an email uh, so that they can uh, get the, all the queries uh, clarified. If you're okay with it, we can go with some questions. Uh, there's a question from uh, Bala, Dr. Balaji from he called me and he messaged me through Insta. He said, um, in all your Yale tech exposures, he said, um, you give a big incision immediately for all exposures. Uh, do you routinely give a big incision even the defect is small? Or uh, he said he has been taught that uh, just to go from the proximal to the distal. Um, your, your thoughts on this? I think, yeah, uh, so exposure for the recipient vessels uh, for the defect. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, the, I mean, it really depends on, it, it depends on the, on the quality of the recipient vessels, you know, the, the exposure will be greater if, um, if we need to get outside the zone of injury and if the vessel quality is not good, then I'll go a little bit more proximal and get further from, from this, from the injury. So it, it depends on uh, defect size, vessel uh, vessel quality and how far i need to get outside the zone of injury you know but if the vessels are really nice and you don't have to go very far you don't have to you know go very proximally going more proximally as well allows you to sometimes get a bigger vessel a bigger a bigger recipient vessel also um and sometimes you can find local perforators that are just adjacent to the defect and do a, a perforated perforator in osmosis so that you you don't have to make a long you know incision so I think it's to answer your question, it's the combination of um, getting far enough away from the zone of injury, pedicle quality, vessel quality, um, and also, you know, local tissue tension. Sometimes the quality of the skin is not really great and uh, you want to be able to close the skin pedal over healthy tissue or around healthy tissue. Perfect. Uh, he must be watching the same through the Insta. Uh, probably he would have got the uh, no reply from you. The other question is from the one of the follow up, uh, follow up uh, doctor from uh, Facebook. He has watched the, um, the, the the YouTube live in the Facebook, and he said, uh, since you recommend a like for a like reconstruction, uh, he asked, what's your thought on uh, using a free dorsalis pedis uh, uh, flap for the dorsum of the hand reconstruction? Because he said it might look like a, like a uh, flap similar to uh, for the dorsum of the hand, especially the dorsum of the hand. Yeah, I think their salus pedis is nice, but the, as long as you don't create 
you know, don't understand morbidity that the it's that flap is a little tough in terms of um, um, in terms of its donor site, you know, complications because it's a it's a high friction area, and if you don't have stable coverage after you've harvested that flap, you can end up with more wound problems at the donor site for the, the dorsalis pedis. If you're using a small flap, perfectly fine. I totally agree. The elasticity, the quality, of the color is very similar to the hand. Um, but I would just be mindful of of the the secondary defect from the donor site because that can be that can end up being more of a problem than anything else. So good question. Totally agree. Um, uh, if you need a larger flap, I would look somewhere else. If you need a small flap where the defect can be closed primarily or or skin grafted um, in an area that's not going to be uh, under pressure, tension, or friction forces, then I think that's perfectly fine. You know, and you can make it a sensate flap as well, also for for dorsal coverage. Yeah, um, one more question from um, the Twitter follower. He from Dr. Anand. He said, "In any given chance, uh, would you prefer a free or a pedicle flap for all upper limb injuries?" Because he uh, he says that I knew many surgeons who stopped doing free flap for the upper limb injuries. I mean, that's what his comment. Uh, most of the most of the upper limb injuries can be managed with a pedicle flap. Um, he said, "What's your thought on this?" I love that question. Uh, I, I I kind of I love that question. That's a great question. I tr I always try to do something. You know, I think with the advent of pedicle perforator flaps and and our knowledge of anatomy and all the different options, I always try to do a pedicle flap before a free flap. Not because I don't like doing free flaps. I do free flaps almost every week, but because I think that we can we can we can basically cover just about any wound with a pedicle flap in the upper extremity. Um, and get the same functional and even cosmetic results. So I agree. I, I always try to do a local pedicle perforator flap or an adipofascial flap or a fascial tenus flap in the upper extremity. I think you can you can almost get away with covering just about anything in the upper extremity with a pedicle flap. Um, and uh, you know, as long as long as you follow the, the principles of early mobilization and 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 early functional recovery, I think that's that's perfectly fine and an excellent option. So yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Balaji from Twitter, he says he has a second question. Uh, between the lateral arm flap and the free ALT, I think he feels that both are synonymous, apart from the size uh, for the proximity defect. Which would be the ideal for the skin only flap? You know, I prefer, I prefer honestly, I prefer an LT flap. Um, because the skin paddle is much bigger, the donor site morbidity is, is pretty minimal. You can hide the scar in the thigh, um, and you can thin the flap. You can harvest it superficially. The lateral arm is good, but I mean, I think that the LT, in a lot of ways, has replaced the lateral arm flap. The LT, the lateral arm flap, is good for small to moderate defect, but if you have a much bigger defect, the LT is is much better. Um, and the LT can be thinned as well. In America, the LT tends to be pretty thick because we have high BMI patients. But across the rest of the world, I think that's less of a problem, and you can have really nice, beautiful, thin flaps um, that give you, you know, great dorsal coverage and lots of lots of laxity. Um, and it can be it can be thinned. I, I like I mentioned before, it can be harvested as a composite flap. So a lot of different variants. So I in my in my hands, I much prefer the LT flap compared to the lateral. I'm not saying the lateral flap is not an option, but um, I use the LT flap as my number one option for. Uh, soft tissue reconstruction when I need a free flap for all those reasons. Thank you. Um, I've also got some questions through email. Um, <laughs> so I can uh, probably can uh, redirect all those questions to an email as being a long question, spending of questions list. Um, anyway, um, I think uh, today we have a wonderful session of, you know, uh, the discussion about the, the, the pattern of reconstructions. Uh, surgeon's preferences and Dr. Michael's um, outstanding uh, talk on the pedicle and the free flaps for the upper extremity reconstructions. Uh, many of the followers are here from uh, uh, different parts of the world. Um, they are uh, seeing this live through YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Insta accounts, and also through email. I think uh, uh, Dr. Michael has also given his email address so that any questions we have, uh, we can also direct them. You also direct them to Dr. Michael. Uh, it's a really uh, great day today. I mean, we had a wonderful uh, 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 sort of uh, pattern of reconstructive surgeries, the technical tips. Uh, the good message I really learned is that 
you know there is no time difference or the time is not a significant factor in in you know free flap uh, especially for the upper limb so the delay or rather uh, uh, early free flap i think uh, time is not a significant factor i think one good message which i really you know uh, learned today is that the time is not the significant factor most of us we follow the godinas rule of uh, less than 72 hours I mean 3 days uh, which we have been insisting on that and that's definitely a good a carry home message for me and most of our readers are all, I mean the listeners are also from different parts of the world i think they are also uh, would have learned a lot of messages uh, from this uh, you know exclusive and a comprehensive talk about uh, the upper limb uh, reconstruction so uh, dr michael i'm really thankful to you uh, for accepting our invite giving an outstanding talk and uh, really uh, it's very beneficial to all our uh, uh, you know listeners throughout the world uh, i just like to conclude with your uh, concluding remark or the closing remark probably uh, from dr michael well you know i want to i want to tell you i want to thank you for the invitation it's really great to um, to join your webinar and this is such an important platform and contribution for education across the world i can't tell you you know how important it is um, we have a very similar platform for the microsurgery you know for microsurgery imc which has had a huge impact on bring, bringing people and surgeons and trainees globally together to um, to learn and share information and education. So um, kudos and congrats. I continue this. It's really important. Um, I think that, um, you know, upper extremity soft tissue reconstruction is limited only by your imagination. Uh, there's so many different perfitters and, and flap options uh, that you essentially um, I agree that you don't always need a free flap. You can use a pedicle local flap for just about every everything. You know, if you know how to do a radial form flap, a latissimus dorsi flap, and a few important intrinsic, you know, hand flaps, you can cover just about everything in the upper extremity. And it's a question of knowing those flaps really well and knowing um, how to use them in different scenarios, I think is really the key. And in, and in working with your therapist to get early range of motion is really uh, absolutely important. Um, and in a lot of parts of the world where there's, we don't have microscopes or micro uh, equipment, doing pedicle flaps is really kind of the only option. And um, so, so knowing that really well, I think makes all the difference. Um, proper debridement, like I mentioned, is, is critical. Uh, you can do early coverage after proper debridement uh, and then composite reconstruction either immediately or in a delayed setting, de depending on your facility and, and uh, patient factors. But I, um, um, I, you know, I would encourage all of you to um, learn as much of the vascular anatomy of the upper limb as possible, because when you know the anatomy and um, the vascular anatomy and the pedicle and everything else, you're only limited by your imagination. And one thing that I learned a lot when I was in Louisville, I worked with Bob Acklin, who is a phenomenal anatomist and microsurgeon. All of you should, should be familiar with Bob Acklin's work, um, but he ran the Louisville uh, anatomy lab and was an, was an anatomist at the end of his career and all the fellows would go to the anatomy lab we would have access to upper extremities and we would dissect and um, have flap courses and um, I worked with Ahmed Gupta who's a who's a phenomenal microsurgeon and one thing that I learned was basically vascular anatomy of the upper limb and that helped me tremendously in my career because when harvesting flaps I really knew uh, I knew more about the anatomy uh, and they gave me more options and, and I, I felt more comfortable doing local flaps. So I would encourage you to um, to do the same if you have access to cadavers or an anatomy lab. Um, go and do a dissective flap first before harvesting it if you don't feel as comfortable. Um, talk to colleagues, um, you know, look at webinars and videos. And, and the more comfortable you are, the more you'll be able to do things. Uh, and, and you will be able to tackle any upper extremity soft tissue defect and, and not really be worried or are concerned about it. Um, so, and that comes with time and experience, but uh, again, great platform, Terrence. Um, thank you for organizing this um, and good luck to everyone. It's uh, hand upper extremity reconstruction is, is, is a wonderful field and um, uh, I'm open to any, any questions in the future. Good luck with your careers and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for your uh, kindness and also for your pragmatic uh, closing remarks. I can't argue more on that. It's absolutely uh, you know, pertinent and clear to all those uh, listeners. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we end up this day with a good note of uh, loads of message on understanding the vascular anatomy of the upper limb. 
I think that's what the uh, the residents or even the consultants should go and look back on this. So uh, we'll keep meeting uh, every month with this IPL series. Till then, um, goodbye and God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Yeah.